am Gabrielle Pettingell. I did serve for about three and a half or so years with the Stargate program. Uh, my background was uh, I have an undergraduate degree in psychology. Um, I then went into the military, served in military intelligence. I worked in several unconventional units doing uh, sort of strategic planning and analysis. Um, I bumped into the program uh, while I was doing that and thought, I want to do this. So when they had a slot open, I, I left the service um, and joined the, the program as a civilian. While at the Stargate program, I was a remote viewer. I also was an operations officer and I also was a training officer. So I kind of wore three hats. I remote viewed the whole time I was there, um, but in between I also did a lot of training, trained quite a few people, and uh, was uh, also ran a number of operations. Um, after leaving the unit, I got my MBA from Wharton, uh, worked as a management consultant, and uh, also stayed in the reserves the whole time. And so, you know, Paul and Lynn kept saying, come, come join us, come join us in the, in the real world. And I kept hoping, you know, since I had my clearances, maybe the government will do this again. I'll just sit back and wait, uh, like a real dreamer. And uh, so uh, after 10 years, uh, I've, gi I've given up and I've come out of the closet. So this is my first kind of exposure to the RV community in the civilian world, aside from uh, working as a trainer with, with uh, Paul's company. But um, so be gentle with me, OK? <laughs> I, I don't know all the politics, and I don't want to know all the politics. But so anyway, aside from that, what I'm going to do today, Paul, to make sure I totally stepped out of the closet, invited me to please talk to the audience, particularly to the people who don't have a background in remote viewing. And he said, I want you to set the stage. I want you to set the stage and tell people what we mean by remote viewing and give them a little history. Um, and then tell them some more and then let them try it. And I said, how much time do I have, Paul? Do I have the whole conference? And he said, 90 minutes. I said, OK, so this is what we're going to do. I'm going to start with the history, and it's going to be fast. And as you know, history and reality is very murky. And lots of things happen at the same time. And history in books is very linear, OK? Now, to be able to do it fast, I'm going to make it linear. So if I, if, I, if I twist something just a little bit, a date, who did it, or, or that, forgive me. It's so that it, it makes sense to people who are new to it. Then after that, I'm going to tell you what, give you some definitions of remote viewing and some examples, and tell you what we mean by it, and tell you uh, show you the process a little bit, and then I'm going to show you some sample sessions. I'm going to show some from some students, and then I'm also going to so show an um, uh, example of a commercial application of remote viewing. And then after that, I'm going to give you all a chance to try it. I've selected some targets, and then I'm going to have someone who's never done any remote viewing pick one of the five targets I've picked, and then you all are going to have a few minutes, and I'll, I'll give you a procedure for doing that. And then we'll give you your feedback. So this is sort of a test run. This gives you a chance to try it before you do the real experiment um, tomorrow. By the way, any artwork you see in the background, except for the picture where I have a pic picture of Ingo Swan, that's Ingo. But all this artwork is Paul's. He, um, I don't know how many of you know that, but he is quite an accomplished artist. And he tends to do things kind of like this. And, and it's pretty neat. Uh, again, the topic of here is remote viewing. And um, I like the expression martial art of the mind, because what we're talking about isn't something spontaneous. It's something deliberate. It's something practiced. It's something that if you use discipline and do it repeatedly, you get better. There also brings in the concept that some people are, pick it up very quickly and are very good at it. They become black belts. And other people, it's a bit of a chore. Um, I don't think I ever got past a white belt in karate, and there's a reason for that. Um, and the sim same thing is true with remote viewing. Anybody can learn it, and there's going to be some people who are more talented than, than the others. But the more you practice it, and the more you apply a strict discipline to what you do and do everything precisely, the better you get. And that's, that's me. That's my company. And I wanted to start, again, this, the one thing we want to make clear is this, this is IRVA, the International Remote Viewing Association. We're not here to talk about other things. We're not here to talk about channeling, mysticism, out of body, um, and any other new age topic you want to talk about. We're here strictly to talk about remote viewing. It's, it's pretty narrow, but it's just as exciting. And here, just to set the stage, I want to start with a definition of remote viewing. This is from the DIA Remote Viewing Instructors Manual. And uh, it, it says, the acquisition, remote viewing is the acquisition and description by mental means of information block f 
from ordinary perception by distance, shielding, or time. And again, that means describing something when you're not physically co-located with it. That's, that's it, okay? And um, remote viewing, in the way we mean it, is something that has structured protocols. It's not just a spontaneous um, action. It's reproducible, it's trainable, and it includes processes for dealing with what we call mental noise. And I'm gonna be talking in depth later about mental noise, but really what that is is just your imagination or, or your analytic response. In real life, when we see something, like we see a cat peering around a door, we just see part of it, we say, oh, that's a cat. We have a little bit of information, we complete the picture using our analytical self. In remote viewing, we get the information in also a little, and our mind says, oh, and makes conclusions about it. They get a little bit of fur, they might get a, a, a hint of green, they hear something that sounds like a meow, and we say, oh, it's a cat. And that is what contaminates remote viewing. It's just the same thing that we do in real life, but in remote viewing, you don't have enough information. So imagination wreaks havoc. It might actually be a lion. It could be a dog. But with those few little pieces of information, your mind instantly starts to form a picture. And so in controlled remote viewing, you have to have processes which teach the viewer to look for what that happens and deal with it. And that's what makes this different from natural being naturally psychic. This is what makes it trainable and re reproducible. It's the ability to handle mental noise, and I'll talk about that more. But first, I'll start with a history. Okay, well, it's good. We, we go back to 1960s, and in the 1960s, at least, it, everywhere in the world, people were starting to get interested in the human potential. You know, physically, we're reaching for the stars, and, and science had reached all these, these you know, new reaches, and, and so human, the human potential was the next frontier, and everybody was interested in it. And in the U.S., that was really more of a pop culture thing, particularly when it dealt with ESP. Um, on a scientific front, it was more, there was such skepticism around that type of thing that most experiments dealt with proving it, proving that psychic processes exist. Meanwhile, in the Soviet Union, they took it for granted that it existed simply because of their culture. Okay, so they started already, it exists, what can we do with it? And so they had very intense and rigorous programs to find these natural psychics and put them to use. What are the military applications? What can these people do? So they weren't interested in so much in training or figuring out how to you know, get everybody to do it. They just were saying, we have these people, what can we do with them? And our intelligence services saw that and they got to get a little concerned because they saw we really weren't doing anything. But that's kind of what's happening in the government. Meanwhile, in, um, in a little town called Menlo Park, there was a, a think tank called Stanford Research Institute, SRI, and there was a laser physicist there, Hal Puttoff, who had finished a laser project and was thinking, you know, I really would like to learn more, uh, find out more about, you know, these extrasensory processes. What can we do with it? What, what is it? I want to do some experiments on that. And if you work for a think tank, anybody works for any kind of um, consulting firm knows uh, that if you want to do something, you have to find your own money for it. <laughs> they, they don't just give you money. You have to go out and find money. So he went out and he got an initial grant from Frank Church of, of Church's Fried Chicken to, to look at that. And he, he also started just circulating um, uh, ideas, proposals around. He circulated in the government and with other organizations who were doing psychical research, um, and, and that was happening. Meanwhile, again, remember I told you real world, real world history is not linear. Um, in New York, an artist, um, writer, and naturally psychic person named Ingo Swan um, was realizing a, a little bit about his, his abilities and was offering him up, himself up to a couple of different studies as a subject. He worked with City College in New York and he worked with the American um, Institute for Psychical Research and he bumped into the proposal and so he contacted Hal Puttoff and, and sort of the rest is history but they went on to do some studies. He and uh, Hal Puttoff invited Ingo Swan out to SRI and his initial interest was in PK, psychokinesis, m creating movement of matter with, with using just mental energy. And so he had this, another scientist had this device that was designed to measure the magnetic field set off by quarks. Now what quarks are, 
are little tiny itty bitty bitty bits of, of, of an atom, and they're very small. And so you can imagine the magnetic field they set off is very small. And so you can imagine that any other magnetic field anywhere else in the world um, would be larger than that small little itty bitty magnetic field set off by the quark. So this device designed to measure that is buried in concrete. And around the device there are several, several layers of shielding. It's designed so that the only thing that's going to touch it is that quark's little magnetic energy. And then, you know, back up on ground, you know, there's a little meter, you know, a chart that comes out, you know, just like an EKG or something, where it, it measures, okay? Um, and so he came, he got Ingo Swan there, he said, I want you to, to affect that, that meter. I want you to, to, to make it move. And Ingo looked at him and said, right. <laughs> and so he thought, well, how can I go about doing that? And he thought, I don't even know what it looks like or how it works. So he got out a piece of paper and he started to sketch. He started to remote view the device, okay, to get an idea for what is it? What is it that, I, that I'm supposed to make move? Well, how, while he was doing that, the little meter started moving, okay? And everybody said, oh. <laughs> and when he stopped, the meter stopped. And so... Hal Putoff took that little experiment and he attached it to some of his funding requests. And it just happened to go across the desk of somebody in the CIA. And it also just so happened that Hal Putoff happened to have a security clearances left from when he had been in the service. So everything came together perfectly. The, the CIA, who was very concerned about what the Russians were doing and wanting us to get involved, all of a sudden had this perfect package. They had a, a, a scientist, a very legitimate scientist, one who had uh, had great credentials, who you know who wasn't already contaminated a lot by the world of ESP, um, willing to do research with good subjects, and so they gave him money, and that started the the program fully. So, um, it, Hal put off, and, and then had Russell Targ join his effort, and a number of other people, um, and. Uh, the name Scanate wasn't its an initial name, but uh, it was a name I think Ingo Swan came up with for describing the process of rem remote viewing, that you're, you're sending out a scanner, and that's where that name came from. And as I'm, actually, as I'm going through this history, um, most of the people are here. Hal Putoff is, is going to be here, Russell Targ's here. Uh, later on, you'll see Lynn Buchanan, Mel Riley, Paul Smith is here. All the players are here um, at the uh, Skip Out Water Whom You Already Met's here. Uh, this person's not here, so I included a picture of him. This is Ingo Swan. Uh, I was taken a number of years ago. Uh, he's standing in, one, in front of one of his pieces of artwork. Um, and so, so we had, anyway, so we had SRI doing work, and they did a lot of things. They gave up PK pretty quickly because they saw it was very hard to study, and they weren't getting that far. Then they started to look at other types of psychical processes, and they came across studying remote viewing. Um, and they learned a lot about it over the years. They learned that you can't shield from it. It's not, it has no kind of radiation. They learned that. They learned, uh, they learned that you can just give coordinates and a person can tell you about it. Then they learned that you don't even have to use the real geographic coordinates. You can just make up a number and if you have an idea of where you want the person to go, they'll go there and get information. So they, they learned lots of neat things um, uh, o over the years. And Again, like I said, this story has lots of threats. Meanwhile, while the CIA was doing this, the Army uh, had a group in Fort Meade that looked at, it was called Operational Security Organization, OPSEC. That means they're interested in protecting our secrets. And they had this systems exploitation team that went out and tried to pretend they were the enemy spying on, on us and to help units get their act together and, and be better about their own security. So this, this organization was you know, going out and, and getting their satellites to take pictures or they would go and, and, and see if they can talk to people in the unit and get them to tell something about it. They, they would pretend to be like the enemy trying to infiltrate the organization. And one of the people there, a, a then Lieutenant Skip Atwater, who came up here briefly, um, a head had read Mind Reach, the book about the SRI work, and had um, had some exposure and found some files that, that dealt with 
the work being done by SRI. So he went to his commanders and said, we should be doing this. The Russians are doing this. We should be seeing if it really does work. And so they decided to, to develop a very inexpensive program to see if they could, quote, psychically spy on, on our own, you know, on our own people. I mean, on our own units. And so they went to SRI and got some protocols and started work. And some of the original people from that unit, Mel Riley's here, a couple other people, um, they started working. And at that time, they, uh, there was still not yet a set method to train remote viewing. And so they would just say, okay, I'm thinking of it. There's a target in this envelope. Tell me what you think about it. And they would try different techniques, like maybe being in a meditative state or, or you know, just writing things down. And, and it worked. They had fairly good results. Um, and that program was called Gondola Wish. Uh, now, as these units were, it quickly became obvious there was a lot of issues with, one, it was working, but two, they were doing it against U.S. peoples, and that's a no-no. Um, you're not supposed to, uh, to do strange things with your own people. So they had a lot of human use issues. And so they started to say, well, you know, maybe we should be Spy, using it to spy on, you know, on the enemy instead. That would solve the problem of involving American citizens in something they not, don't know they're involved in. And they also um, started to develop procedures for having permission uh, to do this type of thing. Uh, meanwhile, you know, so SRI was doing research. You had the Army starting to kind of think of a way to apply it. They weren't that concerned about the research angle. And there was also an Air Force unit who was dabbling in it. So then uh, DIA got involved and started to pull together these pieces. And that program then was renamed Girl Frame. So it was the same program. And they were starting to develop, you know, starting to realize that this actually works. They would give an intelligence question to the unit, and the unit would describe things like, uh, like what does a particular weapon system looks like, look like? Or what's in this, in this building? We've always wondered what's in this building. And everything moved along. Meanwhile, back at SRI, um, Ingo Swan was doing a lot of work thinking on how, how do I do what I do? And how is it, how can I make it better? How can I deal with mental noise in a structured way? And he started to think about it, and he came up with his own little protocol. And it turned out it was teachable. So then, um, uh, DIA passed the program totally back to the Army because they decided it's politically not wise to dabble in these things. So the Army had the program all by themselves, and they sent people, a group of people, Paul Smith was one of them, um, to, uh, to go to, and Ed Dames was one, and Bill Ray was one, and then there was uh, one more person, Charlene, who's not here. They went and were taught by Ingo how to remote view using his new methodology. Um, and it was very it it was very successful. These people, uh, some of whom had very little background in anything psychic, were able to actually report and describe things that were not in their physical proximity. And not only that, uh, they saw they improved over time, and it was fairly easy to train it. Um, then the army, of course, at this time, the army had been dabbling in a number of things like this. Um, aside from doing the remote viewing, they were also doing a lot of other kind of esoteric things like uh, neuro-linguistic programming and uh, hemisync and, and a number of things. And when the new commander of uh, Army Intelligence came in, he was a skeptic and he did not want this in his unit. So fortunately, DIA stepped forward and took, took the unit back. So it came part of what was known as Sunstreak at DIA, and that's when I joined the unit. And the unit continued to operate, doing operations for on intelligence problems given to them by various organizations, the CIA, Army, Air Force, DIA. Whoever had a question who had, had kind of bumped into the program would submit their requests and, and the unit would gain information for them. Um, at the same time, SRI still was working for DIA doing, doing research in these processes. Um, later again, they, they changed the name again to Stargate. Stargate's kind of the, 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 uh, the known name for all this stuff because that was when the, when the program was terminated and it was announced publicly. It was under the name of Stargate. The name change had just occurred simply because they changed some of the, 
the security classifications. So whenever you do that, you have to change the name, which they did. Um, when uh, DIA, again, people who have been, were involved in this program usually became believers, but there were always some skeptics around, and there were always people who didn't want it on their turf, whether they believed or not. And there's a reason for that, because the American public um, really, especially at this time, was not going to be really happy to know that, that money was spent on this kind of thing. And so this program kept continuing to be shuttled around, because while people wanted it, they liked the information they got out of it, it was still somewhat of a hot potato. So um, in the early 90s, DIA kind of uh, shuttled it back to CIA, who really didn't want it. And the reason they did it at that point was DIA's mission had changed. And um, the whole intelligence community was reorienting because DIA was starting to do things CIA was doing, and CIA was starting to do things DIA was doing. Okay, one's the Defense Intelligence Agency, the other's the Central Intelligence Agency. And so they were saying, we need a clear line. And what the program was doing was very strategic. So they said, it should be CIA, because it's not really tactical. You know, it's not at a, a, it's more usable by everybody, not just a service. So they wanted to push it back to CIA. CIA didn't really want it that much. So they said, well, we're going to com commission a study uh, to see if, what this unit has been doing for the last uh, 10, 15 years is, is really been worth it, and if there's some validity to it. Well, um, so they got a small consulting firm, uh, the American Institute of Research, to look at it. But there was a problem. A lot of the projects the unit worked on, um, they couldn't get clearance to let them even look at it. So the, with a very minute, limited set of files, they gave it to this, this consulting organization, which hired both a skeptic and a pro-psychic person to look at the data. And of course, of course, the, the pro-psychic person came up with, yes, it was statistically valid. They did prove that it does work and it's useful. And the person who was not, who was more of a skeptic came and said, no, they did not prove that it was uh, that it really, you know, was applicable and, and worthy. And since the CIA wanted the latter answer, that's what it went with. So, um, so the program was killed and the, the study was published and it was announced to the American public they had done this work, but not to worry, it was not being done anymore. Okay. So that left a void. <laughs> and it left a void and it left something very useful. And so, of course, uh, a number of people very wisely started to set up companies to further explore this and, and to do and, and to build on what the had originally been started in these units and to make it applicable to one, to train others to do it. It is a human skill. Everybody should know. And it really, the goal I think of everybody who ever works in any of the companies I know is they want to train as many people as they, as they can. They think this is something everybody should know how to do because they can do it. Um, in addition, they also want to find out applications for how do we make this useful to people who aren't spying? <laughs> you know, what are, what are the practical applications for companies, for individuals, for humanitarian organizations? And, and that's kind of where we are now. And that's, and that's what kind of IRVA is about, is, is supporting these efforts to get more people remote viewing. So, that, so that's sort of the history. And now I'm going to do sort of a remote viewing 101. Uh, Again, I want to tell you, it, it, the best way to understand what something is is usually to know what it is not. And in this case, it's not video in the head. And, and, and I'm guilty. I know when I talk about when I remote view something, a person will swear I was there and walking around based on my description because it sounds like it. And, and it's really not. It's not like you just are taking, like you're in this other site, you know, observing as you would be if you were standing there. You, when you remote view, you get little packets of information, maybe four or five concepts like red, blue, green, or, or if it's more uh, higher level concepts, you know, religious or educational, or, and it's, it comes in in bits and pieces, so it's not video in the head. Um, now, as you collect more information, it does start to fit together and the puzzle's completed, so you do get a very you can get a lot of information about the site, but it's not as if you were there. It is very hard to remote view things that are man-made constructs like symbols and numbers because it is not video in the head. Um, the other thing it's not, it's not astral projection. Um, you know, both your bodies stay where they're at. 
uh, it's also not channeling, and it's also not a, a out of the body experience, OBE. So um, what it is, again, it's this procedure for gaining information, physical descriptors, okay, we're using a set of structure protocols, and, and again, anybody can do it. It's reproducible, it's trainable, and it's got specific ways of dealing with mental noise. Um, what it, one thing to realize that for remote viewing in this aspect, there's certain criteria that have to be careful to be there for you to consider that this was something done by remote viewing and not, you know, not contaminated by analysis or something. The viewer must be blind. The viewer, because of the effect of the imagination, the viewer can't know what they're working. Okay. It's best if the monitors know if they're using a monitor or somebody in the room with them who's record, you know, asking them questions or whatever. It's best that the monitor not know either, so that they don't lead them on. Um, the cueing or targeting must be non-suggestive. And that's the idea of using like a, just a number to represent the target. Like I say, I want you to describe the Eiffel Tower to me. I'm not going to say describe the Eiffel Tower to me. I mean, how are you going to be able to remote view knowing that? I'll say describe site 46234. And, and you'll tell me, oh, it's, it's metallic, it's big, it's, and you'll start to describe it. But if I tell you to describe the Eiffel Tower, I can't trust that you're not just describing the one that's in your imagination. Um, for remote viewing to work, the viewer has to ultimately get feedback. Um, and that's, that's just the idea of something being trainable. You can't learn something if you don't know how you've done. So feedback is how that's done. At some point, the viewer needs to know, what did I view and was I correct? Similarly, known truth, there must be a known truth or a ground truth. You can remote view anything. You can remote view the contents of a book. You can remote view um, an idea. And so if, if the target doesn't really exist, um, you're, you're trained to give an answer. So you'll go to the, the next thing available. If there is not really, say, um, say I believe that a crop circle, or no, no, that's not good, let's say. Um, say I believe that there is, a, a company is going to, uh, has plans to build a facility in the future, and I ask you to remote view it, and something happened and it wasn't built because the company went bankrupt. Um, there's no telling what, what you'll come back. You're not going to come back and say there's no facility, okay? You'll you'll probably remote view and say, either give the ideas for the initial plan, or you might report there's an empty area, or whatever's currently in the area, or you might report that, um, uh, who knows what else, something that's nearby that's of interest to you, you know. So if there's, if there's no answer, there's no telling what you get. So you have to make sure if you use remote viewing that you know what, that the viewer, what the viewer was working on exists. Um, if you want to, to be able to truly believe your, so your, your results. That's not to say that for fun it's fun to work against something where the ground truth isn't known, but you have to realize there's no way to know whether or not you're actually viewing the site or somebody's ideas about the site, or even you know, a novel about the site. There's no way to tell if they're actually going to that physical locality because there's no mechanism for that in the remote viewing protocol. Okay. Similarly, when you get remote viewing, you get little bits and pieces of information. You don't get it all. It's not the video in the head. So if you're trying to answer a question, it's best if you have what we call other ints. That's other forms of intelligence. If you're trying to find a person, you can't just rely on remote viewing. You have to have an idea where was that person might be, what might have happened. To, to be able to look at the results you get, the results are not going to be complete. They're going to be bits and pieces, just parts of a puzzle. If you don't have any other pieces of the puzzle, the remote viewing is not going to be that useful to you. So you really, it works best if it's paired with other forms of information. The most important component of, of remote viewing, um, in the, we, as we talk about it, the formal structured remote viewing, is that having a way to deal with mental, mental noise. Again, natural psychics can be very good. It's usually they're very good or they're very, and then they're very bad. And the reason is mental noise. Their imaginations kick in. And there's several types of mental noise. The first is analytical overlay. And some of you may know these as stray cats. It's what your mind does 
to finish the picture. You have bits and pieces of information, and your mind says, aha, it's this, aha, it's that. And again, with, like with my example with the cat, you, you, you don't have enough information to truly make those conclusions, but your mind has been trained to make conclusions. And so um, th that process of making conclusions based on limited information is called analytical overlay. And that's one of the things that we find we can train viewers to recognize and deal with. Another type of uh, mental noise is environmental overlay. Say I'm working in a room on a project and there's a woodpecker out in the yard and I hear a tap, tap, tap in a report, well, there's a tap, tap, tap at the site. Okay, so that's, that's the environment kind of encroaching in on your process and you have to be careful to realize, did I hear that for real or did I hear it, you know, in my mind? Inclemencies, if uh, the viewer has worries, if the viewer is physically distracted, that will affect, can affect your sight if you're not aware of it. Um, if you're very, if you've had a very bad day, you're sad, you're, you're just droopy, and you've been asked to remote view a carnival, you will probably, if you don't realize that you're doing this and haven't been trained to deal with it, you'll probably report on a very horrific place, you know, one that is, is, is depressing and gaudy, and, and, and it's all based on your own emotionals, uh, emotional response. These are called inclemencies. So you have one of the things that we train is to teach you to deal with these things and not them allow them to affect your viewing, um, these, these, this type of mental noise. And the last type of mental noise is when you have more than one viewer working on something. Sometimes if there is such a great import, a t importance attached to it, or if it's something that's very hard to view, sometimes the viewers will view what each other is viewing as opposed to doing their own independent um, of work, okay? And that's called telepathic overlay. Or in the case, again, if it's something where the target is not exactly what it's supposed to be, um, the viewer will go to the next strongest psychic signal. And they might go to the, to the person who's tasked it intent, the monitor's intent. If the, if the monitor believes that something's at the site and it's not really there, and the monitor really wants to believe it's there, sometimes the viewer won't go to the site. They'll go to what the monitor wants just to please them. That's called telepathic overlay. Um, types of remote viewing. There's many different ways to do this. And uh, one type's called outbound or a beacon. That's where uh, a person actually goes to a site and then the remote viewer reports where that person is and what they're doing. Okay, and, and the idea sometimes of that is that there might be an increased, you know, psychic energy attached with a person doing that or, or uh, it's, it's just one, one way of doing it. That's called outbound or a beacon. Another is called extended remote viewing, and that's the idea of, of putting yourself in a very meditative state, lying down, and then describing, say, getting coordinates, and then just describing what you see. That's called extended remote viewing. Associative remote viewing is, is a technique that's using remote viewing to answer questions. Like, say you want to know whether stock A is going to go up tomorrow or down. That's something we'd all like to know, I bet. Um, well, you can't remote view that, okay? It's numbers, first of all, and it's concepts. And, and really, what's, the, what's up and down when you think about it? You know, up and down for, you know, for the head of the company is a little bit different than what up and down means to you and me. So it's very hard to remote view. So instead, you don't ask the remote viewer to, to view that. You don't even tell them that's what you're interested in. What you say is that I'm going to hand you a picture tomorrow night after the stock market closes. I want you to remote view that. And uh, you have two different pictures, one for if it goes up and one for if it goes down. And that's called associative remote viewing. The remote viewer is not actually remote viewing the question in hand. They're remote viewing something stand that's designed to stand for the question. That's some associative remote viewing. Last, we have what I teach, which is controlled remote viewing. This is a step-by-step -step process where you're not in a uh, trance or anything, where you're sitting up using pen and paper to systematically describe a site. And the process kind of goes like this. We have, um, when, when you're remote viewing, the information comes in in bits and pieces, and it comes in, at first you get a little, and then you get more. So you, you start, you have sort of a general feel for the site. Oh, it, it seems like there's land or, there's, or it's mainly water, it's mainly structure. That's the major gestalt. That's kind of your first impression of the site. 
then little bits of information will start to trickle in. And we, we train it in this order so that, so that the viewer can control mental noise. By doing this step-by-step -step process, and by starting with the very simple and then building up to the complex, the viewer can control their imaginations better and keep track of that process. So then we start with very simple sensory data. We do tastes and smells, colors, textures, and sounds. So that the viewer might say, if it's the Eiffel Tower, um, first they'll say the it's a structure. It's a structure. And oh, it, there's, there's green and brown and, and I see white and it's metallic and it's, 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 it's crusty and it's, I hear people sounds, I hear traffic, uh, and it smells, ooh, it smells like gas, you know, it smells like exhaust. Um, and so they get this type of information, and then we have a move on to dimensional concepts. So they've had this initial, initial sort of sensory exposure to the site. And what we found with those sen that sensory data is the imagination tends to leave it alone. It's used to having that type of information in the brain and, and, and just letting it be. But then you start to get dimensional information, and you say, oh, it's high, it's, it's, it's wide, it's, it's got holes, and, and so you start to describe the Eiffel Tower dimensionally. And that's where the imagination really starts to kick in, and that's where we start to train the viewer to be realize that's when they're going to say, oh, it's a bridge, or oh, it's a girder, or oh, it's a bungee jumping tower. Um, and we, the viewer is taught to uh, how to separate their response from the true data. Um, next, we move into more complex data, and that's qualitative and intangible data. And then something like the idea of it being a monument or a tourist attraction, or that it was, that it's old, um, and some of its history will start to come through, and that's where more in-depth in information comes in. Now, when, when they're remote viewing, a lot of times the viewer will say something very complicated, and you think, where did that come from? Uh, and so then there's a procedure called stage five, where you kind of go offline, you're no longer accessing the target, and you look at what you've already had and try to figure out, well, what made me say something? Um, if I said uh, the word uh, museum, and you think, well, what made me say museum? And then you, in stage five, you'd break it out and say, well, I saw exhibit, I saw exhibit case, and I saw, um, you know, a couple things that relate to a museum. That's called stage five, and it's, it's breaking down the information you've already gotten into what caused that information to be said. Lastly, um, you can do what's called stage six, and that's looking at the site in detail. It's either in th a three-dimensional mode, describing in great detail the physicality of the site, like making a clay model, or doing a floor plan, a room by room. It's where you start to really put together all the information you're getting and have enough contact that you really can say, this is in front, this is in back, this is to the left, this is to the right, on a three-dimensional way. But it also is a point in time where you have enough site contact where you can move in time and say, okay, what happened at this site a year ago? Or, or uh, or in the future, or a hundred years ago, where you can move in time. This is called stage six, and it's, it's when you have enough site contact that you can do sort of a four-dimensional assessment of the site and get more detailed information. So those are the, the, state, the six steps we teach. Um, obviously, you don't have, have to remove you that way, but it's a way that we've found, if you follow the protocols, that help you go in this order from very simple physical information to complex ideas, you can better control your mental noise and, and, not, and, and keep working without trying to guess what the site is. Okay, so why learn to remote view? And, th and this is our advertising pitch. And all the companies here are equally good, so I'll say that. But <laughs> anyway, here's a quote. Um, by Dwayne Elgin, he was one of the SRI subjects, and I, I just love this. It says, once you discover that space doesn't matter, or that time can be traveled through at will so that time doesn't matter, and that matter can be moved by consciousness so that matter doesn't matter, well, you can't go home again. And for me, that's the biggest reason to study remote viewing. I, 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 it was certainly a major change in my way of viewing life since I started remote viewing, the before and after. I'm still the same old mundane boarding person I was, and that hasn't changed. but there's this kind of just spark saying, yes, you know, I, I can do this. This is neat. I can trans, I can move in time. It's, it's, 
I guess it's, it's the way I capture this moment is, is the first time I give usually a student something like the lunar lander. It's their first time off, quote, off planet. And they finish that session and they find out what, what the target was. And they might have described seeing this blue ball up in the sky or something like that. That it's that reaction to I did this that you can't go home again. And it's a very powerful thing. That's, that, that's one of the reasons. Um, the next reason gets into the whole martial arts of the mind. It's a discipline. And why do people study karate? Yes, there's a self-defense element, but I'm sorry, most of us will never have to use karate for self-defense. So, so why study it? And why study it so intensely? Obvious, if you know one or two really good moves um, and target places on, on, your, on your aggressor, you know enough about self-defense. So why spend hours and hours studying karate? Well, it's the same thing with remote viewing. Uh, because it is a discipline, and you do get better, and, and, it, and you do grow, you know, you do grow in this technique, and you can, a, and it starts, you see other ways to apply it to your life. If you have hobbies, uh, you remote view maybe some of the things that have to do with your hobbies, or you just become better able at finding parking spots, or whatever, but it's, it's that idea of, of it being a discipline and something to work on to improve yourself, um, and it is very difficult. And it is a natural high. When you do get a sight right and you describe it, it is very exhilarating. So again, it's, it's a human skill, every, you know, and, and I think everybody should learn a little bit about it. Uh, it's, it's interesting. It's a focused discipline. The process feels good. It feels good to remote view. Um, and people have found many personal applications for it. Again, people are historians, you know, remote view historical events, and it may, it's interesting to them. Um, other people do the humanitarian applications, perhaps, you know, trying to get information for missing people or that type of thing. And of course, there's, you know, there's professional applications. There are companies, uh, there are many questions that we could answer for companies, and we do. Uh, things like, um, is my patent being infringed upon? And so you remote view where that's being used and see if it's being used the same way the company did it, okay? Um, that's just some, one of many possible, you know, pro professional applications. Do you have any questions on what remote viewing is, how I've described it, or the history, or anything I've covered to this point? Uh, yes. An outbounder, you can use really any, type, any form of remote viewing. You know, the controlled where you write on a paper, or the one where you kind of lie down in a sort of altered state. Um, and what you're describing, instead of describing uh, the site, you're describing where a person's going. And they won't decide until they're out there. Like they'll go off in their car and then they'll open an envelope telling them where to go. And it's, it's one way of also making sure that, you know, nobody knows what you're working. And the person goes to that site and they maybe walk around for a few minutes and then come back. And the remote viewer is supposed to report where that person is and what they're doing. And, and there's, there's always just been a question, does it help? that a person, you know, is a, is a person, you know, sort of sending additional information. That, you know, hasn't been able to be confirmed, but it, it sometimes seems to have an effect. And then extended remote viewing is, is just when you're sort of in a, in, you get into a meditative state and report. Yes. The way it, the way it evolved was, it, it started out, I guess, at SRI. How do you get a remote viewer to go to a particular spot without telling them where to go? You know, because if I tell you I want you to go to the Eiffel Tower, you're going to be, you won't be able to work. Too much imagination. So the, what they started with first was, well, why don't we give them the geographic coordinates? And so they'd say, you know, go to 36 degrees north and 42 degrees east or whatever. And they used that and they found out it worked very effectively. But then, of course, the skeptics say, well, these guys have all these maps memorized, okay? And so obviously they know that at, you know, 36 degrees, 42 minutes, blah, 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 uh, there's the Eiffel Tower. Uh, and so they thought, well, you know, the, they'll kill the program if people go there. So then they thought, well, what if we just write down a number, a set of numbers, and say we want that to represent the Eiffel Tower? And they did. They, they would just randomly pick uh, eight digits or ten digits and say, that's the target. And they would write somewhere down, they'd say the intent. They'd say this equals Eiffel Tower. And so they just tell those invented numbers, and this is the hardest thing to believe, I know, uh, to the viewer and they go there. They, you know, if, if, if they can psychically remove, you know, view the site and tell you what's there, they can certainly figure out what you want. 
you know, is, is kind of a simple way of looking at it. And the way they do that is, is just using this set of numbers. Other questions? Yes. How does the remote viewer do what they're doing? And there's a number of theories of, you know, what, what's going on physically that they would know that. You know, how are they connecting? How do they, why does intent matter? And it, it, that, that's, that's a several hour conversation right there. And again, it's not that confirmable. So you'll see there's a number of different opinions about, um, and you know, if you grab me in the hallway later, I'd be glad to, to talk to you about it. It's just, it, it seems each school of thought has different ideas. Um, and the main thing is the viewer has to believe they can do it, and then it works. You can get some telepathic overlay between the viewers, but if they're trained, if they're all trained viewers, that's very, it happens very rarely. And that's what we did in the unit. We would have, um, say we have to describe uh, this new weapon system that was under, in a, in a um, hidden, in a, in a Quonset hut or something in, in Russia or something. Different viewers would work it and report, and each viewer have sort of a different angle on what they would be describing. And then you, they put the information together, and it would be much more valuable than if just one person had remote viewed it. And, and that's, how, that's how operations are run. You don't just trust the results of one person, because this isn't foolproof. It's not 100%. It's really about 80% at its best. Okay? People have imaginations. They have good days. They have bad days. So you don't want to put all your apples in one basket. You would use a variety of people and have them work it more than one time. The way the pro most of people teach control remote viewing is they use columns for different types of information. So that you would use a column for what they call like tangible information, things. So like if you saw a chair, you'd put it there. And then they use a column call for, uh, for um, what some people call EIs or, or people. And in that place, you'd, you'd have persons. Now you can cue yourself. When you're remote viewing, if you see a person, uh, you can cue yourself to say, I want to know what the person's thinking, or I want to know what it, his job is, or I want to know this. And you would cue yourself. And some people do that by acting like they're asking the person. You know, in their mind, they'll say, what do you do? Other people just say, job, question mark, you know. And, and get information, more information. So it's, it's, a, it's a process where you can keep cueing yourself to get more and more detailed information. The trick is to, to follow a protocol that allows for you to recognize imagination and mental noise. That was kind of the idea I introduced with, with the martial arts. You know, like in, in karate, you know, I'll never go past a white belt. And, and, you know, when I was awarded, well, my yellow belt, when I was awarded my yellow belt, the instructor said to me, um, we really didn't think this person would get to this point. <laughs> and we gave, I got the most improved award uh, for, for reaching the yellow belt. And I, I wisely realized that, that this body just doesn't go there, okay? But I got that far, you know? And if somebody grabs me around my neck, they're history, you know? I know enough to do that. Okay, then again, there's other people who are more talented and they'll go on and be black belts. The same thing is rem with remote viewing. But the difference is, a lot of times people don't know that ahead of time, okay? Because our society so quelches um, psychic experiences. I mean, even I, if my, well, no, that's not true. But if, if most people, if their children start to describe what's in, the, in a room they've never been in, you know, they get told, oh, you're imagining things and, oh, this is really ridiculous, stop it. So our society squelches that. And the only way some people find out that they actually were, or ne were very naturally psychic as they start taking some training and all of a sudden they take off. Um, but most, some people usually have some, some clues, you know, some interests or they always seem to sort of know who's on the phone, that type of thing. So there is, it's not something we're teaching from scratch. It's an it's a inborn human ability that we are just pe teaching people to use. You know, people don't, know how to write from birth, but they have the capacity to be able to read and write. But we have to teach it. So everybody is born with a capacity to remote view, and, and they just need to be taught it, and, and some will be good at it, and others won't be that good. Okay? So now here, let me show you some so just some simple sessions. Uh, first, I'm going to show you some student sessions. These are mainly students at a time where they've just had a few classes. Um, and some are single blind and some are double blind, and I don't remember which, so don't ask. Okay, all the student was given was an encrypted coordinate. You know, 22, 33, 56. Um, today I think I'll allow that to be, ah, 
Today, that number will be the Hagia Sophia Mosque in Istanbul, Turkey. And so this novice remote viewer you know, came up with that. Okay. And this is just showing just a piece of their, their session. They actually would have said, oh, it's a structure, and maybe described again some sensory information about it. And then they did a dimensional sketch. Okay, here's another example with the Great Pyramid. Okay, that, that was their sketch, and I'll, I'll uh, read their description to you, since it's, it's not very legible there. Uh, session summary. At the, end of the, at the end of the session, before they're given their feedback, they're asked to sort of summarize what their session was. And this viewer said, uh, rising up over a bleak, spare landscape is a solitary, solid structure, colors of black, white, and gray. Um, it's like when I was drawing, the, the sketches morphed into a triangular structure like the Cheops Pyramid. Okay, well, what, it was the Great Pyramid, but that he recognized that as himself as not having enough information to say that. that. That was his analytical response. He didn't actually get the word Cheops Pyramid in his head as data. Um, the structure is located in a bleak, undescript, expansive area, which was gray and monotonous. Bands or lines move horizontally across the structure, and at the top, the lines radiate around the peak of the structure. It is solid. Okay, solid structure. Okay, here's the monastery. That was their sketch. Um, their description, which, which is too lengthy, so I'm going to just switch back to the drawing while I read it. The structure is multi-leveled with squares, repetitions of triangles, and a dom domed area. There's a parking lot outside and trees. There are people here. There's a stepping down or up area. There are bird and barking sounds. Colors are white, green, gray, red, blue, gold, yellow, brown are present. Inside, the colors brown and black are also present. There's something green colored and gritty. Um, there are windowed surfaces and stone surfaces. There's light shining through colored glass. Something is round, tall, and narrow. There's something ornate, and the structure has historic value. See, that's an example of an intangible. Um, there are rectangular doors and cars in the parking lot. There is uh, an impression of seriousness, respectfulness, deeply felt feelings. It is a place where opinions are expressed and people have anticipation of outcomes. There are people in white flowing clothing with draping over the head on some. There are books and files at the site. There's a work of art here. It is a holy place. Okay, so that's from a student. Sort of a, so, so you can see the type of information. It's not as if you're there with a video camera, okay, or they're walking through it, but when all those little bits of three and five words they get in, or ideas come in, by the time you put it together, it's pretty comprehensive. You know, and this is, this is again, probably about 45 minutes worth of work. Okay, here's a, a sample operational session. And um, in this case, it was a client who was afraid uh, another company was doing, they had information that another company was using one of their manufacturing processes illegally. They were patent infringement. And, um, they didn't, they wanted to know whether they should waste more resources going after this company. Because they would have, obviously they can't use remote viewing and take it to a court of law. And say, hey look, you know, uh, Gabby Pettengill remote viewed that this is happening. Um, we've got to, you know, they owe us millions of dollars in damages. But what it did, what, by telling them certain things that, that maybe a processy was being used, they could find, use other means than to go out, spend the energy to go after a company. Now, again, you can't, you can't expect a person to give information like they have a video camera. So in this case, the client needed to know, it was, it was um, what they wanted to know was whether or not um, it was a, a process involving nozzles and gases and things like that. And so they were able to say, if ours is the only process that uses gases that you know, smell like this or look like this. And ours is the only process that maybe uses nozzles that are shaped a certain way. Um, and I don't want to go into any more detail because I don't want to infringe on their patent. But here, here's just some sample sketches. And I'm going to read, this was, now on, on a project like this, you have maybe four or five viewers and you have probably, um, you know, 20 sessions or so. A lot of work. And so this is just a small excerpt from one session. Um, and again, the, the viewer was only given encrypted coordinates. The person monitoring him had no clue what he was, wor was working. To be able to get him to where we wanted, what we, what we do is a process where we use their own words to cue them. At some point, he said, there's nozzles here. 
So the monitor said, tell me about the nozzles, okay? So once the cue of nozzles was given, um, and this is, this is the writing of the viewer, immediate impression of Bernoulli principle, along with dimensional concept of necking down and tapered. German word spritzen came out, and that means squirting, along with sucking, re-cueing of nozzles produced cylindrical, tapered, and ported, designed to reduce turbulence, um, to improve flow efficiency, then to contribute to turbulence, to chaotic interaction later in the sequence. Items are relatively small, very hard, shiny, machine, precise, but also thick-walled and robust or durable. There's a concept of projecting into as well as mixing streams which lead to laminar flow. There is the idea that these nozzles externally taper to a rounded end through which a, a fluid or a gas is propelled. But a little ways back from this end, there are ports or openings to let the cylinder, which pass through the channel through which the substance is being projected. And um, it goes on and on and on. And he, he's, you know, he says tolerance is here, reach the micron level, there's a sense of venting. So this is the type of information. He's not giving enough that you could possibly make this thing, okay? But he's giving enough that somebody who knows about it can say, this is type A or type B. Okay, so that's kind of the idea of remote viewing. You don't get this perfect information as if you're there, but you do. If you ask the question the right way, it can do very powerful things. Okay? Ah, this is the fun part. Who is brand new to remote viewing? Has never tried it? Okay, come on up. I want you to tell me either A, B, C, D, or E. Just stand up. Say a letter between A and E. C, okay. Everybody, the target is C. Okay, and we're going to say for our coordinates is today's date is what, the 18th? 14th, okay, 0614C, 15th, 0615C, okay? That represents the site for picture C in his folder, okay? You can either remote view the photograph or you can go to the site. It's your choice. And so what you want to do before you get started, I've told you the coordinates, is clear your mind. Write your name, date, and location, and the time at the top, okay? We're in Las Vegas. It is 2.06, and it's the 15th, correct? 15th, June 15th, 2001. Now, can somebody tell me why I'm asking you to write down where you are? The reason is you can't know where you're going if you don't know where you are, okay? So that's where you are, okay? Put your worries away, which you have none because we're having fun and write your coordinate and think, what do I perceive, okay? And while you're, while you're writing down, the, use simple words and phrases. You're le less likely to have imagination if you limit yourself, limit your vocabulary. And I'm gonna give you exactly four minutes to do that. Is it, was it a clear picture? Did you get an instant impression of what it was? Was it hazy? Little bits and pieces coming in. Does anybody wanna volunteer? Ah, oh, you don't want to. Uh, you don't want to participate. This is no fun. <laughs> yes. Uh huh. Bits and pieces. You're not certain. It's kind of ephemeral. Just sort of. Did I really hear that? Did I really see that? Kind of like that. Yeah. A well, fog, like little bits of structure. Yeah. It's not. It's not a clear thing. It's very. It's. It's. It's almost like if you. Did I really? It's sort of like it came in over here, and you. You sort of looked at it out of the corner of your eye. That's kind of the feeling if you're getting good data. Does anybody want to volunteer? What? what the gestalt is. Remember we talked about the gestalt being the main idea? Land, structure. Okay, somebody got inanimate and they didn't sense any people. Lots and lots of blue and some kind of idea of black bars. What about you? What did you have? Gritty, brown, blue, temperate, blue-gray. Okay, lots and lots of land. Okay, a big box, almost like a nuclear power generator, something like that, yes? I realized I was looking at a broken slat fence and um, I was trying to figure out, well, white, what in the world would white be? And then all of a sudden I got an impression or a feeling of a tower. Finally, by the time I quit, I realized I was looking at a lighthouse on an old dilapidated beach with a uh, wooden um, walkway. But I don't know how much of that I dreamed up myself and how much of it came to me naturally. Yeah, see, see that's the hard part, because you get the information comes in bits and pieces, but your mind wants to complete the picture. And your mind wants very badly to complete the picture, because that's the reason you're alive today. If you didn't take in bits of pieces of information in everyday life and immediately make conclusions, like um, that ring on the ro stove is red, therefore it's hot, you know, or that is a line behind me in the woods, you'd be dead, okay? So 
the mind has been trained so thoroughly to, to jump to these conclusions. So you'll have bits and pieces of information, and then I'll try to create a picture. Um, and, and the idea is, how do, you, how do you deal with that? You can't keep it from happening, but what you need to do is figure out, OK, if it's complete, I have to reject it. If it's bits and pieces, um, then it's the correct image. OK, it's the correct data. A cylindrical structure. And then um, I, I saw a silo, and then a kind of rectangle with an opening. And then, I don't know, uh, like a kind of teepee. And then when she said, man-made but natural, and it was very warm, thinking that there was a kind of glow there, or some kind of a fire. Well, my summary is just uh, it's a lightweight, light-colored, curved, smooth object that's taller than it is wide. And in some way, it mimics a life form. Mimix a life form. I like that. The process itself, and we call it the signal line, knows that your imagination will take over. So oftentimes it'll describe things in ways that really sound ridiculous but are true. Like I, I recently had a client who was remote viewing a swimming pool, and, and his subconscious knew if I'd say the word swimming pool, he's going to have a hard time working because he's going to get AOL about every swimming pool he's ever seen. So they said, a large container, stone container of water. Well, that's the swimming pool if I've ever seen one, OK? And that's the way. A lot of times, as you get better and better at this, your mind will be, get sneaky and figure ways of, how do I tell him what, I, what, what we perceive without making his imagination kick in? And that kind of phraseology is exactly the type of thing. OK, now, OK, it's man-made and natural. It's not, it's not temperate, but look. You have the idea of the teepee is there, OK? Everybody got a lot of white, OK? Um, there's not a structure, but there is people there. Uh, and so, so you see, it's very, you see how the good data comes through and the imagination can take over, OK? A, a lot of people did, had gritty. Gritty and brown came across, OK? The white definitely came across. That shape, everybody had kind of that shape that was talking. Um, but you see how the imagination tries to kick in. And that's where trained remote viewing helps you, okay? So did you have fun? Okay.